once again, just if you um, want to ever send me questions, uh, you can find me at Billy Carando. Um, also, my DMs are always open, so Twitter doesn't always do a good job at letting me know when DMs come from someone I'm not following, but I do try to check it regularly. All the same, you can also find me um, at William Crando at IBM.com. So again, always happy to answer any questions you might have. And don't need to go through this again. Um, but specifically, uh, I have um, blogged a lot on JNFI, and almost everything in this presentation, um, I have also kind of went into in blog form. And some of these concepts, like I'm taking a whole lot of all JNFI five and trying to condense it down to an hour. And so there's a lot of like cool and interesting things that um, might be hard to kind of fully communicate in spoken form, but I can kind of go into in blog form and then also have code examples as well to follow. So um, check that out if there's something that, like, hold on, that sounds really interesting, but I want to know more. Uh, so what are the goals of this presentation? So there's two major goals. Get you excited for automated testing. So automated testing is something I've become really passionate about over the past couple of years. You kind of saw from my history, so I've been developing for over two, 10 years, and I worked with a lot of organizations, and a lot of these organizations I worked at, pushing to production was painful and slow. Like we would be only pushing to production maybe a few times a year outside of some sort of like exception release because it was addressing some sort of production bug. But otherwise, it'd be like a three-month lead time where it's like, hey, you know, the June release, okay, we're having to start planning that out, you know, in March or something. Um, and getting to production, releasing production, I would so often run into issues where it was just always a very stressful moment because I would think, um, you know, like, oh, everything's fine, but then you find out you release some bug because when trying to fix like another bug, you cause something to break somewhere else. Uh, and automated testing addresses a lot of that, and I'm touching on that just a little bit more in a second here, and then of course also when it gets you excited for JNFI. Um, but what really changed my perspective on software development was the book Continuous Delivery by Jez Humble and Dave Farley. Uh, has anybody here read this book? Because I, I can't recommend it enough. It's really going to kind of change your perspective, or at least change my perspective on software development. Uh, sorry, a couple of hands. But, uh, I remember first kind of hearing, yeah. um, fully not understanding it, what continuous delivery was, I don't know, maybe like seven, eight years ago. I was like reading some article, I think it was Flickr at the time, I don't know it really still exists, um, <laughs> that was like pushing to production like a dozen times a day or something like that. And again, coming from an organization that did it like once every three months, I'm like, oh wow, being able to push production all the time, that's, that's really good, that sounds like a big improvement. And while that is a really cool aspect of continuous delivery, that ability to rapidly release uh, new code to production, it's actually one of the more least interesting things about continuous, deli continuous delivery once you learn about it. So the two big things with it, when you do a highly automated, or you know, as automated as, you know, as is reasonable to do, is you get auditability and reproducibility. So what do I mean by auditability? By automating everything, and in this case particularly automated testing, you can actually go and see what is being tested. It's like, oh, are we testing you know, this call to this endpoint? Okay, yes we are. Okay, what are we sending to that endpoint? Well, we're sending this information and then we're expecting this back. When you have that as an automated test, you can actually go and review that to see if that makes sense that that was actually run. Whereas if you do that manual, you're kind of relying upon a manual tester to go out there and do that, and maybe they do something slightly differently this time, or they maybe ran the test, but they accidentally ran it in the wrong environment. There's a lot of things that can go wrong when it becomes some manual regression testing, and it's just not a good area to do it. It's also, on top of all that, much slower. I mean, while an automated test suite, you know, if it's really, really large, it can maybe take a little while to run, um, it's still going to be vastly faster than trying to do that manually. And of course also you get reproducibility. You know, you can just kick off another run of that automated test suite to see, wait, do you get the same results? Or if you made a change, you can kick it off again and know that it's the same test all running again. So that way, if something changes, it's like, okay, that's because, you know, of the change you made. 
again, with like manual testing, you're depending upon that tester um, to actually go through and exactly do that manual test script or whatever run again. And just that's a human issue where you can't really have that kind of guarantee. Um, and you can't ever go into a tester's brain and know that, okay, that's actually all the things they did. And again, this isn't an issue of complaining about testers being bad. It's just an issue that humans, that's not what we're good at. Um, even if you fully automate everything, you'd still want manual testing, but that would be like more exploratory testing and stuff like that that maybe would be kind of continually happening in parallel, uh, but maybe wouldn't necessarily be a step before production. It's something we continually have going on. Um, but this is really interesting, and it's, it, as reading this book and kind of those concepts, like, oh, that really kind of addresses a lot of those things. So like my last presentation, a lot of those manual processes, they were put in place because, well, someone at some point released a bug for production that caused a major outage or caused some major issue. And so we're gonna add process, we're gonna add some sort of manager sign-off or something like that. We're adding a bunch of sign-offs but like, you know, that manager, that VP, they're not actually checking that. You know, they were checking the code, like, that, that doesn't make sense. You know, they're not gonna possibly have that knowledge to know like, oh, well, that changed by Billy Crandall, like that was correct or incorrect. That's just not practical. Having these automated systems addresses a lot of those concerns and allows you to go much faster. Um, so, but yeah, that's what automated testing gives you. Gives you confidence you're fixing what you set out to fix. This maybe kind of touches on the TED, process, I haven't even really followed it, but before you commit code um, to your repository or push it to your repository, um, you should have some sort of test, testing that change to make sure it's correct. And then as you build out your automated test suite, you're gonna get that confidence, you're not gonna be introducing a new bug by accident, because I can't tell you how many times where I fixed something in one area, and then that causes a break in another area. And then also, it's gonna give you confidence as well, you can kind of go in and make changes, like there's this one awful class that's just ugly and everything, you want to refactor it. If you actually have automated tests over it, you can kind of go in, refactor it, make changes, make it look better, um, and those automated tests are going to be there and kind of give you the confidence that you just didn't completely um, mess up the rest of your application in that process. Uh, it's also why I say without automated tests, you're building legacy. So if you're, you can, however well architected, however late version, the newest version of Spring Boot you're using, if you don't have automated tests in there, that project's gonna gradually grow out of date, it's gradually gonna go to, and accumulate just weirdness to it, to where at some point it's gonna be this old legacy application that you're eventually just gonna to have to totally rewrite. And also one that final thing to kind of keep in mind, even though we spend all day working on like the code that our organization uses to do whatever business important thing, in the end, it's really only a very small portion of the code that you're actually running in production. If all well, that, you know, you have all these other dependencies, and within them, you know, it could be security holes or, you know, performance stuff, that if you're not being able to get up to the latest, you're not getting those security patches, performance enhancements, or whatever new and cool features, um, and again, an automated test suite would be like, oh, okay, I can have confidence that I can update this application. This is what I was talking about earlier um, when it came to requiring um, multiple data sources in a Spring Boot application, um, and the weird bug I ran into, that bug could easily have been found if I, in a real application um, by writing a pretty simple uh, test to cover for it. And that also kind of covers other areas around database connectivity, so it's like a kind of test you would still kind of have there anyways. Uh, but yeah, I can't really emphasize enough that automated testing is, if you're not doing it, it's probably that along with automate or not doing any automation that's kind of underlying maybe a lot of the frustrations you maybe have when it comes to pushing production or having your applications get out of date. But enough about just automated testing, you're here to do chain of five. Maybe you're already doing continuous delivery and you're like, shut up, I already know I'm doing all that. I wanna know about chain of five. All right. So what are the goals of Jane of 5? Why wasn't Jane of 4 good enough? Well, of course, the goal with every major version change is to modernize, to improve upon what you have out there that you couldn't really do within like a minor release. Um, and the biggest for that is, for Java, or Jane of 5, is Java 8. Spring Boot, or Jane of 4, was released in, I believe it was 2006, 
Um, and that was like right around the same time Java 6, Java 1.6 was released. And I believe, yeah, Gene 4 was compatible back with uh, Gene 5. Of course, then over that, uh, from 2006 to the release of Gene 5 in 2007, a lot has changed, um, both in the software engine industry, but of course, Java specifically. And the biggest change is Java 8. And the biggest changes that came with Java 8 was the inclusion of lambdas, uh, default uh, method interfaces, or default, uh, yeah, default method, interfa uh, default method interfaces for interfaces, and then also strings. And we'll see how all of those get incorporated into Gina 5. Uh, another big thing that Gina 5 has, it's, it's very extensible. Uh, that kind of goes back to my previous presentation where Gene 5 that exists at a very high level of just trying to solve the general question of testing um, for all Java developers. But of course with that then is that your organization, you're gonna have maybe specific things that kind of make sense, common repeating patterns across many concerns. Um, and it'd be nice if you kind of extend upon what already has in Gene 5 to kind of already address those things so developers at your organization aren't constantly agree having to solve these same problems or are having to maybe always include like these two tags and these two classes all the time. Um, Jane 5 is really easy to extend upon to where you can kind of do that stuff pretty easily at your organization or maybe just within individual projects. Of course, also backwards compatibility, that's really important. Again, to what I was talking about earlier, maybe you already have hundreds of thousands, hundreds or thousands, maybe more, of uh, automated tests at your organization, you're already doing continuous delivery. As you know, I may say create things with Gene 5, but you get to completely rewrite everything, um, you're not going to do that. So, of course, Gene 5 made a really great goal towards being backwards compatible, and they do a really great job. And again, we'll see a little bit of that in this presentation. Requirements if you want to start using it, as I mentioned, Java 8 or later, um, with NetBeans. 11 being released uh, about two or three or so months ago. Um, now all the major IDEs, um, any recent version, and really goes quite far back or IntelliJ and Eclipse, um, is gonna have support for Gene 5. Again, really just try to be on the latest, try to be on the latest version that's gonna give you the best experience. Gradle, again, 4.6, but I believe it's like 5.3. I was the most recent, so just be on that. Um, and Surfire, uh, just really definitely want to be uh, at 2.22, but actually you want to be on 2.22.2 now, because they actually just released that um, maybe about two weeks ago, and they fixed some really small bug in Jane 5. I've never run into any issues on bugs um, using Surfire 2.22, but being on that makes it a lot easier to work with Gene and 5. All right, let's start writing some tests in Jupyter. And so, uh, and by Jupyter, so one thing I didn't really touch on is also Gene and 5 is much more modular. Um, there's three major modules. There's the platform module, and that includes all the tooling support for things like Surfire and your um, Eclipse, or for your IDEs. Um, then there's Vintage, and that has all the backwards compatibility for Gene 4 and even Gene 3.8 or later. Uh, and in Jupyter, that is the new programming model. So, like when you're actually writing tests, what you're actually technically working with is Gene at Jupyter, um, but it never really matters too much. Uh, and you're wondering why the name Jupyter is the fifth planet from the sun, and it also happens to start with JU. So some language changes, or at least some changes if you want to start running tests in Jane 5. So in Jane 4, if you were running that test, you would use for Jane test annotation. Well, now you would use uh, Jane Jupyter API uh, test, um, same annotation more or less, uh, but it's just a way to signify that this is a Jane 5 test. Assertions, they have like a new assertions um, library. Uh, ignore has been replaced with disable, and disable is an improvement on ignore, which we'll cover later. Uh, rule, run with rule and class rule uh, have been rolled into this new extensions library. Uh, and then before class and before have been replaced with before and before each for just exact same functionality, but it's a lot more clear in the intent. Um, and same for after all and after each. So let's look at actually. Um, 
writing some tests using JN5. One, moment. I forgot to switch my... Is anyone here using JN5 yet? A couple. Okay, a few. Good. I'm glad to see... Uh, it's sorry, usually if I'm seeing like maybe one or two hands raised, I'm glad to see that uh, more and more people are starting to use it. So nice. And now I can't make this presentation up on the fly. I see people that could call me now, so that's not good. All right. All right. So I have this. Uh, Existing uh, test class, pretty simple, just four tests, rated in JN4. Let's migrate it and change it to JN5. Good. All right, so, and is that, is that big enough then for everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And so, gotta get rid of that. Gotta get rid of that. All right, so as mentioned, I need to bring in the Origin Jupyter API test. And for the assertions, it's the assertions.assert equals that I want to bring in. So one other change, so with that, uh, that resolves almost all the compilation errors except for this one. So expected exception is no longer supported within the test annotation in JN5, and so here I am obviously testing for an exception, and I also want to test then like the message in the exception because maybe I'm going to propagate that message in the logs or maybe to the user. Um, so I want to check to make sure that's going to be correct. But to do that right now in JN4 with using the expected exception, I have to do this whole try catch. Oh, you can also use the rule. Huh? You can also use the rule expected. Don't get ahead of this presentation. <laughs> yeah, hold on, uh, hold on. Uh, but and then also I can do then three thrill e. Uh, instead, what I can do though in Gen five. Also, I guess he should get one of the prizes since he could. He already knew about the. Uh, uh, rule, so no one else seemed to knew about that. Um, we don't want to spoil your uh, sir. Okay, so, huh? Oh, sorry, we don't want to spoil your. Oh, there you go. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's respectful. Uh, so, anyways, we'll then say what the type is. And then using a lambda, we can execute this method. And then this assert throws also uh, returns the exception. And so now that's just much cleaner. We're not having to have that nasty try catch around it. And then let's run it and see what happens. It's so annoying. So, all right, so we get three tests pass, but then one of them fails. And this one fails because it's using the expected exception rule. Um, but as I mentioned, rules are no longer um, supported anymore in JN5. But let's say, well, you just can't quite give up on rules yet. Maybe you kind of implemented some cool rules at your organization or whatever it might be. So you want to be able to still kind of use them, but you also want to get some of this cool new JN5 goodness. And so to do that, you would use enable rule migration support. And to be able to use this also, you would need um, to use this enable Jane and Jupyter migration support. You need to bring that in as well. Uh, and anyways, then we run this test again. Get it next time. Um, everything passes. All right, so great. 
we, we get back to the point where we are before. We have a little bit better here with the assert throws. Um, but let's start getting into maybe why you should consider switching to Dana 5. So has anyone ever been in the situation where you have um, multiple asserts within a single test and then if that test starts failing and you go and you fix the first assert and then you run it again and it fails and it's annoying. You know, I've been there before. It's very frustrating, especially maybe if you're running it like you have full confidence, you fix the first assert, you run it this week again and it doesn't work. So to solve this, you can actually bundle this all together. With the assert throws. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, I'm going to then make all this wrong. So now I get um, there. Now it gets it returns all the um, assertion failures and it was in a single run instead of forcing me to run it multiple times and go through and fix everything um, individually. Another thing that's also kind of nice. Um, you, so Jane. So of course, like the name of this test, it is test add room, which of course is based upon the name of the method. And generally that's gonna be pretty good enough, but let's say maybe you're writing like a feature test or something like that, and so you want something that's a bit more expressive of what's going on, and maybe this, you know, it's really complex behavior. Um, now you have the display name, and you can just put name in here, and if you run this test again, now we get, instead of test add room, you get a really cool name. Uh, but really, the important thing about this, though, is... <laughs> yeah, the, anybody who's seen it five already knows where this is going. Is that, yeah, you can now actually put emojis within your name. Finally. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> finally. Uh, so the Jania team did not really set out to particularly support emojis. Um, and it's supporting a broader Unicode set because obviously you know, not everyone <coughs> is going to have an alphabet that falls, falls within ASCII. They wanted to be able to offer that. Um, but then with that came emoji support. And while of course obviously the poop emoji is just funny, um, there could actually maybe be some occasional use cases for it. For example, and actually here, you're probably very familiar in Europe, is internationalization, where you can actually then put the flag of the country that maybe you're um, translating to, which could also then be useful, like maybe you're doing Swiss German instead of just German. Um, German, you can put that flag in there and be like, oh, okay, that's what we're trying to translate to. Uh, not gonna be a common thing, this is kind of more, more for the laughs. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, this a little bit for maybe the, the kind of the day-to-day -day testing that you're doing, some of the improvements that come in Jane and Phi. Uh, but let's start talking about some of the more uh, advanced and complex features. So as mentioned, uh, run with rule and class rule have all been rolled into this new extensions model on API. Uh, and so there's multiple ways you can register an extension. They can be registered declaratively with extend with. Mm -hmm programmatically with app register extension, and then automatically with the Java service loader. Has anybody heard of the Java service loader here? One, 
that to, oh, wow, okay, so that's actually an improvement. So only one from like the last presentation to do. It's uh, very, very few people know about the Java service loader, and I didn't know about it until I started kind of getting into this with Jane and Bob. Um, so some of the advantages that we'll kind of get into each of these as well individually is you can now declare multiple extensions in a single class. Um, that's definitely one of the nicest things. If you've ever had that situation where perhaps you're doing like Spring Boot and maybe you want to, so you do like run with, you know, Spring Boot or say unit runner um, or Spring Runner, you know, but maybe there's some other run with you wanted to do where well, you couldn't really do that in JUnit 4. Now you could do that with JUnit 5. Um, you also have a lot of control over the execution order of extensions which could be useful if you're kind of doing either like a higher level of testing like integration or feature testing or something maybe where you have some like sort of complex setup. Um, like I think the example I can think of that is maybe you're doing some sort of feature testing with like, that does like something with like database and caching where you can have like the database one execute first and the cache extension execute second. That's where you can maybe the use of ordering extensions could come in. Also though, if you want to write your extensions, it's nice to have like a single API that can completely cover that instead of having both like the run with API and then the um, rule and class rule API. I haven't really um, implemented much of these kind of extensions before JUnify, but it's still nice to have a single unified API for doing all that. Uh, just touching a little bit on this in the code. But for example, like why you might want to. So like with like registering an extension um, programmatically here with register extension is you can of course they kind of reference fields and values within the test class. Um, these extensions can be registered both as a class level variable or as an instance level variable. And of course, when you do that, there's certain things you may or may not have access to as a class level variable. Um, there is the before all class um, hook within the extension library, but that you wouldn't have that if that was an instance variable for well, obvious reasons that you can't actually do that before the class is even instantiated. Uh, <coughs> and then also the Java service loader, just to kind of show that as well. So to do that, uh, you would put it under um, meta m under your class path, and then under services, and you would have the fully qualified name for that uh, for the uh, extension that you want to have, and then within that file, also then the specific implementation. Again, this is not something that you're generally going to need to do. This could be useful, again, if maybe there's like some sort of cross committee concerns or organization that you just kind of want to handle for everyone. Um, another issue could be for like reporting. Maybe you just want to have some sort of thing that happens around every test. Um, if you're going to go down this route, just one thing to keep in mind is, of course, you're going to be wrapping this around every test in your library or in your, in your suite. So if you're doing a bunch of stuff, that's going to have an impact both on the how long it takes your test suite to execute and then it would also maybe get impact in non-obvious ways with the tests and the developers writing because they're going to be like, wait, why is this weird thing happening? I have no idea why it's happening. I didn't have this extension. Well, it's because it was like automatically added. So it could be very useful, but it's also um, the old Uncle Ben quote, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Dependency injection. So Jane 4, you can only inject dependencies as field values. So of course, just you know whatever variables within your test class. Now you can pass values from the container in as instructors and as methods. Um, one thing that's always available within the test context is a test info. Um, variable and that can be maybe useful for debugging like it would say what test you're executing like a fully qualified name and like maybe some other additional information again can be useful for debugging purposes. Uh, I think one thing that can also be kind of interesting um, I really like Mockito for doing mocks it's just the most straightforward way of doing mocks and um, so with like a relatively recent, like within like the last six months um, version of Mockito, 
they have a new extend with Mikeo extension, which allows you to inject mocks as um, method level arguments um, for a class. And I think why that can be interesting is, so with our test name, you can kind of explain like the overall goal of a test. Um, but, by, but by passing mocks in as method level arguments, you can also say, okay, this is what this test is doing, and then with those arguments saying this test then also depends upon these classes or these services. <laughs> so this can, can be a way of providing more useful information within your test, and maybe if you're actually very you know, um, good about doing that, you can maybe kind of look at your test cases and get an idea of how your application kind of interacts with other parts of the other application, maybe. I think it could be kind of something interesting I'm not saying you have to do it everywhere, but it's just something kind of cool idea you can think of um, that you couldn't do before uh, JMA5. Parameterized test with PS has a dynamic test. Uh, so for, instead of run with parameterized test, that has just been replaced with the parameterized test annotation that you put at the individual method or test case level. Uh, and this is really nice. I mean, so parameterized test is actually just another example of extensions in JMA5. But it's nice that uh, now you can actually have even multiple parameterized tests within a test class. Um, but you can also have parameterized tests along with this normal test in a test class. And that's, if you ever run into the issue, which many probably haven't, um, but um, where you have a parameterized test that does a bunch of scenarios, but maybe have a couple scenarios that fall outside of that, I ran into that once and it was very frustrating having okay, here's the, the parameterized test, and then I had to move a couple of other tests into like some other separate test class. Um, that problem's resolved now in JMA5. Uh, also, you have multiple options for kind of what sort of source you want for your parameterized test. You have value source, method source, enum source, CSV, and CSV file source. Uh, and just a little bit of an example of what those look like. So yeah, like here is using value source. Um, and there's also, you can register ways. Uh, by default, Genia 5 has ways for like converting like these into URIs, um, or these streams into like files or locales. If you have some other one in your organization, like the defaults that Genia 5 has um, aren't enough, you can implement your own. Uh, I don't have an example of that, but I know they have an example within the user docs. Again, probably not something you're going to typically run into, but could be help, helpful if you need to. Uh, also, um, for like if you use like a method source, uh, there's many different ways. So if you name the work, it has to be like a stream, um, and then it has to have like the same um, type as whatever the um, parameters test you're running. And if you give it the same name, so in this case verify date validation, then, then this is good enough. Um, if you wanted to use a different name, then you would have to give it the name of the um, method source. And then you can also uh, I can't quite remember the syntax. I believe it's like a fully qualified name of the class. So if you wanted to reference like a um, uh, here you go, copy qualify name. So like if you wanted to have your method source in an external class that maybe have like a lot of data you want to pull in, um, maybe you can reference it. I think it, that's like the fully qualified name um, pound sign um, and then the name of the method. Uh, repeated tests. So if you just want to have a test run an arbitrary number of times, um, you can use a repeated test for that. I personally haven't had um, much of a need for it, but I could see it being useful. Maybe you just want to send a bunch of stuff to a database. Maybe you're testing how your sequence generator is working. Um, you also have access to the repetition info, which can give you the current repetition you're on and the total number of repetitions, and I think there's a couple other fields uh, within it. Um, 
Like I said, I haven't personally had a need for it, but I could see it being useful if just for some reason you just need to have something run a bunch of times. Or maybe you have just like minor variations where that could be covered in the different repetition IDs. Also dynamic test. Oh, yes? Uh, with the previous one, uh, do, do the results have to be the same all the time? The repeat a test? Yes. No, no, I mean, you can have it run whatever you run it to run. It's just executing that same test case over and over and over again. So. Okay, but the validation in the function uh, of the test uh, are the same constant. Well, I guess it would be the same. I guess it could be somewhat dynamic, and like I said, you had like the repetition info uh, thing to where you could be like, is ID1 still compared to ID1 the same? You can kind of do that kind of dynamic of it, but I mean, it's just kind of limited. You're running that same test case over and over, so if you can program it to have like somewhat different, you could. Um, and I guess also if like maybe one of those, like you have it running 10 times, just like parameterized tests or dynamic tests, you know, like one of the 10 fails, you know, it's not gonna stop the rest of them. Uh, dynamic test. So this is kind of a cool and interesting concept. Um, again, something that could be very useful for certain areas, but not going to be useful for all the time. But basically, with a dynamic test, you're going to annotate a method with test factory, um, and then you're going to kind of write out what the test is supposed to look like. And this is something that took me a long time to kind of figure out, like, what the heck does this mean? Uh, and so the example I have of this is um, but the other example so where this would come into use is that you have like a cross-cutting concern and so the example I have is like let's say I built a RESTful API and I have two different kinds of clients one kind of client sends me JSON and expects JSON back and another client sends me XML and expects XML back so something like that, making sure you're annotating every or every endpoint that can accept both XML and JSON, um, it's something that's kind of manual that can be easy, very easy to miss. And like the standard automated testing maybe I was talking about earlier, like you would have to know to write all those tests out for it, and that's something that a developer can kind of just forget to do. Um, so in this example, what I have a whole bunch of stuff, but basically I'm scanning my class path and I'm looking for um, areas or methods that are annotated with post mapping, then I kind of read the information out of it and then I send a couple requests of XML and JSON and make sure I don't get back the 415 unsupported media type. And so to kind of see this in action, if I were to run this test now, I get two test runs, so two. Now, without changing this test though, if I go in here and then uncomment out this post mapping, and then if I run this test again, I get four test runs. So, um, you know, so yeah, four test runs. Uh, it's something that is, Again, you're going to have a crossing concern, maybe like security could be like another example where maybe for like all your Git endpoints, you know, you only need user level access, but for post endpoints, you need admin access. You can maybe write out a test factory that can like scan and, you know, run some automated tests and that way whenever endpoints are added or removed, that test is going to automatically regenerate and change and then on the next run, based upon what the current application looks like, run it. Um, you can actually even do that technically with a parameterized test and method source. It's just two different ways, maybe whatever kind of makes more sense within that use case, um, you could do it there. Is it the same as property-based testing? Proxy or property? Property, property-based testing. No, not necessarily. I mean, I guess you can kind of do it within that, but um, it's it's not, yeah, quite the same. Isn't that more the, the random data source something? I read about JSON as part of having a, a data source just eventing random data for running your test. I think that relates to property based testing. Oh, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> there. All right. 
test interfaces. Um, this is also another kind of cool thing that took me a little bit while to get my head around. And this is a game where like it's a unit eight concepts or Java eight um, being the baseline is also important. So to kind of walk this through, so tests can be declared on default methods of interfaces. And then of course a test class, they can implement the interface and then execute those tests. And this is kind of similar to how an abstract class could work in Jenga 4, but of course we know in Java you can only have single inheritance, but you can implement multiple interfaces. So test interfaces can be great for making tests a pattern or making testing a pattern make testing the path sorry making testing the pattern easier and then you can also encourage developers to follow those guidelines and then when a pattern has distinct portions you can kind of break that apart into separate implementations or separate interfaces. So a good example of maybe this kind of in practice would be like testing a raceable API. Then it can be kind of difficult, but it's not too bad. If you're using Spring, you have MyMVC, and that's usually pretty easy to use, but it's a little bit more difficult than maybe like your standard unit test. So you can make it a little bit easier by kind of putting this up in test interfaces. But also, REST has a very specific pattern that you're supposed to technically follow. And then also, not every RESTful API is going to need to implement all the parts. You know, you may just have a RESTful API, and all it's doing is has like some Git endpoints it has, and that's not going to be taking any post in for some reason. Or some might be doing everything. You may have posts, puts, gets, deletes, all the different parts of REST. Um, and so for REST API, and then also, like I said, it has a very specific pattern. So if you call API v1, and then like it should be the resources, okay, well, that should return all those resources. And then if you're going to do a post, well, that's where that should be at. It should be at the roots of the URL. Um, then similarly, if you call you know, resources and then a specific ID, okay, that's just return that specific resource. R is a return of 404 if it's not found. And if, again, if you're going to implement a put and a delete, well, that's where it should be implemented at within that API. And a couple other things. And then like maybe if you send invalid client data, um, then that's a return of 400, and maybe there should be an error message in the response. Or was there? Okay. Um, I'm not just, I'm not going to advocate that you should be following the full RESTful all the time. Um, that's just, I'm just using that as an example because we all kind of know about REST. We all probably have worked with REST. Um, and this is kind of where it could come into use. So you can then create a interface. Um, you have some of these methods that a test class would then need to implement, and then you can then reference those methods in a default method as to then how they should actually be used. And I know it's a <coughs> bit a jumble of code all up here, but pretty much what I'm saying is like mod MVC is a performer get, and then using up that resource-based endpoint, um, and then referencing like a specific existing resource, okay, that would should return a 200. Um, and then also I'm saying for get all resources, if I just call the base of the endpoint, that should then return a list of all that stuff. And then also maybe we say we're always going to be doing JSON, so we are still return JSON here. And then also similarly, if I'm hitting like a non-existing resource, um, that should return a status of 404 or not found. So, uh, and then again, you know, you can set those all up so you have like maybe um, an interface that handles like all the Git behavior, um, another interface that handles all the search behavior, and so that way you have a RESTful um, API that only does like Gits and searches, then it only has to implement those two because it's not going to do anything else. Maybe you have a RESTful API that's only doing posts, it only has to implement and test that because you're not going to necessarily want to force someone, you want to maybe have them follow a RESTful API, but if you do as an abstract class, you would have to force them to implement the whole thing, and so that may not make sense for most cases. So by doing this, you can kind of break stuff up. I'm using REST as an example, but like other examples could be like database communication. You know, you may be only doing reading from a database. You may be reading and writing from a database. You may be doing a bunch of different things. Maybe there's a pattern at your, yes? But how about interface segregation principle? What's it? Interface segregation principle. So if you don't want the dependence of the, uh, yeah, methods of the interface, why is it there in an interface to start with? 
but that's the point. By sub, that, 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 the, yeah, the inter is by breaking these up as separate interfaces, is that it would only force them to do that stuff when it would only start to make sense for them to actually implement that full interface. So, like, that's actually our way to make the fall of that by having the multiple interfaces broken apart in the different logical senses um, is how you can actually follow the interface okay. pattern. Um, so, like this is just an example. Again, it's, it's not gonna be something that you're gonna have to do often, but it's a good way to help developers when it comes to writing automated tests, but then also making sure that they're following specific patterns that maybe you kind of agree to at your organization. Uh, disabling and filtering, and again, also like with this, like I wrote a blog article that kind of maybe goes a bit more into depth as to what's all going <coughs> on, because again, this is definitely one of those areas that's a lot to kind of take in that maybe is a little bit hard to kind of cover in like five to 10 minutes. Uh, disabling and filtering. As I mentioned, ignore has been replaced with disable. Um, so, and what's really nice about that is in Jane 4, if you toss ignore on a test, it's just gonna be skipped all the time. Um, but now with disable, you can uh, use logic um, to maybe say, in some instances, this test shouldn't be disabled. And so there's a bunch of default conditions that Jane provides out of the box for when testing is disabled. You can do like operating system. I think that's probably gonna be the, one of the biggest ones is like maybe you have some uh, Unix or Mac developers at your organization and some Windows developers. And of course the padding is different. And you know, for whatever one it makes sense, you can just throw disable these tests on um, Windows systems because our server is actually Nix based and so um, there's tests gonna fail for our Windows developers, but it doesn't actually represent like a real failure. Um, you just be like disabled instead of having to tell your Windows developers like, hey, ignore these test failures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had that, well, yeah, <laughs> whatever it might be, but the important thing is you can say, yeah, toss um, disabled on there that can have it based upon whatever logic that makes sense and you won't have to kind of, yeah. Uh, communicate when those failures happen, be like, hey, don't worry about it, it's not gonna actually matter. Um, like I said, they have a bunch of things, like operating system, JDK version, I think several others already implemented. But again, as I mentioned, like sensibility is a big thing, as <coughs> with JDK 5, and you can completely implement your own kind of custom logic. So if you need to have skip tests or on Tuesdays for some reason, like you can implement that kind of behavior as well. Um, also, like ignore, disable tests show up as skipped in the test report. Um, so like it was so so up there, but yeah, skipped. Uh, you can also filter test. This works just kind of like categories, which I never really used a whole lot in JNF4. Um, but the same concept, you can um, mark a test with at tag, which is repeatable, so you can put multiple at tag on it. Also, you can bundle it in the tag on a test and then you can either exclude or include those tests based upon their tag name. Tests that have been filtered, however, do not show up on the test report. So if 100 tests, 50 of them had a tag on it, and whether you do the include or exclude, it's only going to show up as saying there's 50 test runs. It's not going to say 50 test runs and then 50 skips. Uh, parallel mm -hmm. test execution. Uh, so there's a bunch of different ways to how you configure it. So you can do it at the project level. Um, so here, this is obviously the first, um, uh, first configuration value is turning it on. Um, the config got dynamic factor. So that is seen based upon the number of cores on my, the machine that's running the, town, the test suite, you're gonna have one thread per core. So if there's four cores like it would be on my Mac, um, then there could be four uh, threads for any test. I could set that to two, and then that would be eight, and so on. Um, and then it's also saying the parallel mode is like run threads concurrently. You can also configure it at the individual test class level, so you can have the execution be concurrent or same thread. That would override, of course, then the project level. And then also, um, so here you can also have the, what's called like a resource lock. And so, because all of these tests have like the same value, this can be an arbitrary string, but then it would need to match with all these other ones. Um, 
And so when these two are read writes, and so that means test A and test B will never be executed at the same time. And they also, test C and test D also won't be executed at the same time as A, B, because it's a read write, so they could be a change to C. Test C and test D, they're both just reads, so they could be executed at the same time. However, with this alone, there's no guarantee on order. So, you know, test A and B have some sort of change of state that's going to affect test C and D, then you would need to order your test, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but this doesn't guarantee order. Test C and D um, could execute either before or after. And then, of course, ordering your test execution. Um, so, yes, if you want to. I think probably the most often way people will be ordering tests would be by using test method order and then the order annotation. And then here, uh, one thing that's nice in the way they implemented it is you only have to order the tests that matter where like the change in state could affect them. Uh, so like this one would be executed first, this one would be executed second because it's one and two. Uh, but because these two bottom tests here don't have an order to them, they will be executed after the tests that do have an order. So this is a good way that if you have like a dozen test cases or more within a single test class, you don't, because you want to order maybe only two of them, you don't have to go through and add order on every single test case. And also even before, beyond that, you should only order the test cases that matter because if you start putting order on stuff that doesn't matter, this is going to be confusing for other developers, you know, when a test fails and then they'll be like worrying about order when it doesn't matter at all. By saying order doesn't matter, then order shouldn't matter. Alternatively, though, uh, they have default implemented alphanumeric, which, as the name suggests, by the alphanumeric value, that's when it will be executed. So test A will be executed first, and then test B. And then they also have random um, as well. And yeah. You know, and then you can also set up the random seed as well with as a configuration parameter. Uh, of course, again, like so many things in Genia 5, you can also create your own custom um, way of ordering as well if you wanted to. I haven't really experimented with it, but um, that is something you could do if you wanted to. Also, you can order um, programmatic. So um, if you register an extension declaratively, based upon its where it is within the code file, that is the order it would be executed. So if you have like three extensions at the very top, the one that's declared first within the code file, that's going to be executed first, second, third, and so on. Um, with register extensions here, uh, there's no guarantee on the order unless you add the at order annotation. And also, just to be absolutely clear, you don't need the test method orderer to use this. This can always be used regardless. Um, but anyways, so by putting this order one and order two, it works the exact same way then as a test method order where these would two be executed first and second, and then these would be executed third and fourth or at some point after the first two have been um, executed. I didn't cover everything in GU5, um, covered a good chunk, but there's still a whole lot more out there. Um, one thing I want to touch is if you're using um, a cert J or Hamcrest, which I absolutely love. I definitely recommend those over the default assertion for Genia 5. Um, they, they work just perfectly fine. No, no problems whatsoever. You can use like a really old version of assert J and so on to insert our Genia 5 without issue. Um, there's also nested tests, assumptions. I actually did cover some ability to update the slide. Um, there's a lot more. Um, the user guides. Um, I would say like the only area within the user guides that they could have some improvement is actually on the test factory or the dynamic test. But otherwise, the user guides are absolutely fantastic. Most of this presentation is just me going to the user guides and then like explaining what the user guides say. So definitely check them out. Um, they're very, very helpful. Happy to answer any questions. If you're looking to go to the cloud, there's also a sign up. Um, the slides are there as well and as well as like all the code examples um, for everything. So, any questions then, or? <coughs> wow, just everything you have ever wanted to know about Genius 5. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well again, um, you can find me on Twitter at Billy Hernando. 
feel free to DM me or anything, and also feel free to email me. I'll be uh, more than happy to answer. So, thanks.